Test it. When Amazon released the first Kindle in late 2007, they launched the ebook revolution. Sure, there were ebook readers before, but by pairing a competent reader and a cellular modem with a massive selection of digital books available online for instant purchase without a PC, Amazon upended the ebook business. Almost three years later, ebook sales are outpacing hardback sales on Amazon, and there's a rich ecosystem of both digital book sellers and devices. Amazon's latest revision to the Kindle refines the formula even further. It's smaller, better looking, and cheaper. The third generation Kindle is an evolutionary, not revolutionary update to the product line. While it adds a few new features, notably support for Wi-Fi and powered accessories through the hinge connector, the biggest changes are an improved screen and a smaller, lighter overall package. Even though it uses the same six inch e-ink screen as previous Kindles, it's smaller, thinner, and lighter than the second gen device. And even though the total package is smaller, the screen is greatly improved. The background is wider, the contrast between paper and ink is better than any other e-ink device I've tested. The Kindle's screen is still black and white, a limitation of current e-ink technology, but its refresh rate is greatly improved from previous generations. It's a fantastic screen for reading text, whether you're indoors, outdoors, or in some sort of crazy borderland between the inside and the outside. Amazon has finally addressed the Kindle's lack of luminosity by adding power to the hinge connector which lets special cases, like Amazon's own, draw juice for a light directly from the reader itself. This is a much needed feature and didn't have too big of an impact on battery life. I still managed to get more than a week out of the first charge, even using the light nightly with Wi-Fi and 3G on at all times. I'm thrilled that the third generation Kindle finally sports sane page turn buttons. Instead of only offering the page back button on the left side, the new Kindle includes page forward and page back buttons on both sides. The page forward button is slightly larger than the page back, and both are easy to hit when you need them, and easily avoidable when you don't. And just like before, the purchasing experience for the Kindle is top notch. You can either browse the Kindle store on a PC and send your purchased books over the airwaves to the Kindle the next time it checks in, or you can use the built-in store on the device. While it's handy to be able to buy on the device, I find that it's easier to buy several books at once when I'm sitting at a PC, and even if you only purchase books on the device itself, it's still dangerously easy to buy books from the Kindle store. On the other hand, if you aren't interested in purchasing DRM encumbered books from Amazon, the Kindle probably isn't for you. While you can copy digital books in several popular formats onto the Kindle manually, including Moby Pocket, Plain Text, and PDF, the Kindle doesn't include support for the popular EPUB format. And while you could use an application like Calibre to convert DRM-free EPUBs to a Kindle-compatible format, it's more of a hassle than just buying an ebook reader that natively supports the formats you're buying. You're much better off using a third-party service like Instapaper, along with Amazon's email a document to your Kindle feature, to deliver just the content that you want on your Kindle. While I've been traditionally very strongly anti-DRM for music and video, I don't mind the lockdown nature of the Kindle too much mainly because Amazon has been very aggressive in supporting third-party hardware through apps. There are Kindle apps available on the iPhone, iPad, Android, Blackberry, as well as PC and Mac. While my purchases are locked to the Kindle, at least it's a well-supported platform. Combine that with the discount afforded many digital books and I'm comfortable locking myself into Amazon's proprietary platform. As before, Amazon shipped with a few bonus features in the new Kindle. There's a rudimentary MP3 player, a web browser, and a text-to-speech mode for certain books only. I can't imagine using the Kindle as an MP3 player, but the web browser can be useful even though it's very limited. The slow refresh of the e-ink screen combined with the lack of an analog pointer make it difficult to use the browser for much more than a quick check of a Wikipedia page. So where does all this leave the third generation Kindle? Well, at $180 for the 3G plus Wi-Fi edition or $140 for the Wi-Fi only edition, this is a smoking hot deal for anyone who doesn't already have an ebook reader. It's not quite cheap enough to be disposable, but for $140, bucks, i am much more likely to take a Kindle to the beach than I have been in the past. And at eight and a half ounces, it's safer for bedtime reading than the one and a half pound iPad as well. People looking to upgrade their existing ebook readers have a tougher decision. While the new Kindle is smaller, lighter, and sexier than earlier Kindles or the Nook, it's not a significant upgrade from either in terms of functionality and still falls short when compared to the Nook when it comes to EPUB support. Because of this, the new Kindle isn't a must upgrade device, at least not for me. For anyone who hasn't bought into an ebook reader yet, the new Kindle is an awesome way to get hooked. For Tested, I'm Will Smith. Thanks for watching.